Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Steiner. Today, Bob will be discussing data model, or governing metadata, vocabulary, dictionaries, and data. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions by Twitter using hashtag RWDG, Real World Data Governance. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Bob Steiner. Bob is the President and Principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the Data Administration Newsletter, TDAN.com. Bob has been a recipient of the DAMA Professional Award for Significant and Demonstratable con Contributions to the Data Management Industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you like usual. Uh, like, like always, thank everybody for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this webinar. Um, I've been excited about this webinar ever since we put it on the calendar. I think it's a great topic for people that are interested in data governance, people that are interested in metadata management, how they're related together. Um, one of the really neat things about this installment of the webinar series is that I'm going to kind of use a case study from a client of mine, you know, not necessarily sharing exactly what I did with them, but giving you some thoughts of, of what has been successful for them. And hopefully you will find throughout the webinar that bits and pieces will uh, really apply to you in your organization. So we're going to talk about governing metadata. We're going to talk about specifically governing vocabulary, dictionaries, and then the data aspect itself. So let's get started. Um, before I get started, typically what I do is I'd like to announce what the upcoming webinars in this series are. And in November, we've got another fantastic subject, which is Agile Data Governance, How to Apply Governance to Agile Efforts. A lot of people seem to be interested in that subject, so I'll be glad to, uh, to be talking about that. And in December, We've got another interesting subject. Everybody is starting to hear about this, this thing called the Internet of Things. And we want to talk about the relationship between data governance and the Internet of Things and how it might impact you at some point in your experience of where you are working at, at the present moment. So the Internet of Things is a, is a hot topic. We're going to talk about that in terms of data governance in the December webinar. Also, I wanted to share with you um, something that I'm real excited about, Shannon's excited about, Dataversity is excited about, is the reintroduction of the Data Administration Newsletter, tdan.com. I've partnered up with Dataversity. Dataversity is producing the site, and I am the publishing site. I am publishing the site in the October issue. There's lots of great articles about agile data documentation, about the, the role of the database administrator, about slowly changing dimensions, about data quality and data excellence. Please, if you get a moment, take a look at the Data Administration Newsletter at tdan.com and register to receive notices and updates of the new and, and freshened up, uh, updated material each month. Also, lay a quick note about kikconsulting.com, my website for my business. If you want to learn about non-invasive data governance, that website was just recently refurbished, so please take a look at that site if you've got a moment. A couple other real quick plugs. One is for the book on non-invasive data governance that was published a little bit more than a year ago, and also some upcoming Dataversity events that I will be involved in. So we've got one coming up just in a couple weeks in Chicago, Illinois, the Enterprise Dataversity 2015 conference, where I'll be talking about a strategic framework, data framework based on data governance and governance best practices. And then in December, I'll be down in Fort Lauderdale speaking at the Data Governance Winter Conference 2015. And it's going to be a subject that's relatively similar to the one that we're talking about today, but we'll have much more of an opportunity to, to since we'll have more time, to dig into a little bit more depth of the case study and what it means to govern metadata and governing metadata within your organization. So I hope to see you at either one or both of those events. They are coming soon, so please put them on your calendars. 
Um, the abstract for today's session is, is quite interesting. We're going to talk about governing metadata and we're going to talk about governance metadata, metadata. So what metadata is in your organization that will be extremely helpful to you when it comes to implementing your governance program? So I stated that governance metadata is really easy to understand when you address it in three easy levels. And I'm going to talk about those three easy levels throughout the, uh, the webinar today. Those levels are the semantic layer, the vocabulary layer, the business terminology that is used by your business. And I'm going to share some examples of how meaningful that is to a couple of the clients that I've worked with, but how important it is to get the organization to speak the same language. Uh, one of the things that I have found to be extremely frustrating to management and companies is when they ask questions and they get different answers depending on who they ask because we're not all on the same page in understanding that the terms may be understood differently in different parts of the organization. They may be defined differently in different parts of the organization. But that semantic layer, that vocabulary layer is extremely important to helping to develop a data strategy and to improve the understanding and the cooperation around data in the organization. The second level is the business metadata layer, and that, that's pretty much the data dictionary. And in the example that I'm going to share with you, we're going to talk about data dictionaries in relationship to data warehousing in business intelligence environments and making certain that all the data, or whether it could be a master data management solution, that the data needs to be well defined and we need to have business descriptions of that data. And then the third layer is the technical metadata layer, which is the, the actual the data layer itself where we're talking about columns and databases and tables and you know, relationships between pieces of data and lineage and those types of things. So if we look at the data that, and the metadata that we want to govern from these three perspectives, it really gives us an overall good picture of things that we can start doing immediately within our organizations to, to manage our data and our information better. And the truth is that these three layers, they kind of stand alone, but they also have a lot of things that relate to each other. So there's certainly a relationship between business terms and other business terms, you know, data dictionary entries and other data dictionary entries, you know, data and other data, and there's relationships between the vocabulary, the dictionary level, the dictionary, the data level. So we're going to get into all of those as we pr proceed through the webinar today. Um, so in this webinar, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out for you an overall structure plus a structure for each of those tiers that I just discussed as well as their interactions alongside the, the, the just by standalone and as they, um, they're um, demonstrated alongside other layers. I'm going to provide a simple schematic that you can use to kind of draw this out for people within your organization, and hopefully you will feel that this hour is well spent and that we're, we'll really address some of the topics that you want to talk about when it comes to governing metadata. So we're going to talk about the three-tiered approach to mastering metadata. We're going to talk about a description of metadata at each of those layers. Planning for the purchase of governance and metadata tools. I've just been through a, an episode, or should I say, uh, through a, an experience with an organization of looking at both governance and metadata tools. So there's some things from that that I'd like to share with you. Processes for metadata change management, if we recognize that the three different tiers or levels of metadata are important, we want to make certain that we have change management and policy around when you can change vocabulary, when you can change dictionary, and when you can actually change the data itself. And last but not least, we'll talk about the role of communications in mastering metadata. So that is our agenda for today. Um, Real quickly, at the beginning of each webinar, I like to start with definitions. In case you're new to this webinar series, at least share with you um, my definition of what data governance is, my definition of data stewardship. And since we're talking about metadata itself, let's put a, a definition beyond just data about data to metadata. So let's start with data governance. Data governance, in my opinion, in my, in my terminology, is it's the execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data and data-related assets. And a lot of people tell me that that definition is worded quite strongly. 
I like it in the fact that it's worded that strongly. And in fact, at the end of the day, no matter how we define data governance for our organization, we need to make certain that we do execute and enforce authority over the management of data. Some of my clients will take that definition and use it exactly the way that it's written there. Others will take it and tweak it and, and lighten it up a little bit so it doesn't sound so threatening. But the truth is we need to make certain that we execute and enforce authority over data. We can. You know, we can communicate, we can harmonize, we can orchestrate people and process and data, but at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we enforce that authority over the data. My definition of data stewardship may be a little bit different from other people's definition of, of data stewardship and data stewards. We've done webinars in the past on the fact that everybody in the organization is a data steward, and I told people to get over that and understand that that doesn't necessarily make the program much more complex. But the fact is that people in the organization that have a relationship to data, whether it's defining data, producing data, or using data, need to be held formally accountable for how they define, produce, and use data. So we, I typically talk about data stewardship in the term of formalizing accountability over the management of data and data-related assets. And last but not least in the definition category here, we've got metadata. And most people know metadata to be data about data, but the definition that I use is that metadata is data that's collected in tools of information technology that improve the business and technical understanding of data and data-related assets. So let's break that down real quickly um, before we, we jump into the session. You know, metadata, it is data. It is data that's collected in the tools, and whether that tool is a, is a paper napkin that you draw a model on or it's a data modeling tool, or if it's a spreadsheet where you store de definitions or it's a dictionary tool. Um, those are your tools of information technology, and we need to make certain that in order for something to really become metadata, it needs to be documented, it needs to be recorded somewhere. So it's really data that's collected in tools of information technology that improve the business and technical understanding of data and data-related assets. So the question is, why is that important? Why do we have to have a definition of metadata that's clear to people within the organization? Well, certainly when we're talking about terminology, business terminology of the organization, whether you call it your semantic layer or your vocabulary, you know, we need to make sure that we write these things down, that we make these things um, accessible to people, especially if we want them to all get onto the same page as to using the same terminology when they're talking to their customers or their clients or their providers or their vendors or whoever it is. We want to make sure that people in the organization speak the same language. let people know and share it. So it's very important that the metadata itself is collected somewhere. And we'll talk a little bit about what are some of the places where we can store it, what should we be considering when we're looking at different tools of the, uh, of the data governance environment. The last definition is my definition of non-invasive data governance. We're not going to really talk about that a whole lot in the session today, but there are webinars that I've done on that subject, and I'll be glad to talk to you about it if you, you have questions about how we can stay non-invasive with data governance. But in my opinion, non-invasive data governance is the practice of applying that formal accountability through a non-invasive framework of roles and responsibilities, trying to be transparent and supportive and collaborative rather than being kind of in your face with data governance. We really want to be less threatening. We want people to understand that their accountability for the management of data is really related to their relationship to the data, whether they define or define and produce or define and produce and use. You know, different data, there is a certain level of accountability that our management will tell us that these people have to have. So when, we, when it comes to the end of the day, when we put data governance in place, we're going to execute and enforce authority over the management of that data, but we want to do it in such a way that's not threatening, that people um, are, are willing to adapt and absorb it into their culture of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we're going to start talking about governing this metadata at these three different layers that, I, that I've laid out, um, and I'm going to lay out a little bit further, um, we want to talk about looking at it from a high a high level architecture perspective. A couple things to consider when we're getting started in governing metadata. One of the things is we want to be realistic. We want to make sure that we're not going to try to boil the ocean and we're not going to try to solve every 
metadata problem that we have all at once. We want to make sure we take an incremental approach, that we learn from the mistakes of what we're doing. We want to make sure that we focus on the business metadata and not just the technical metadata. Metadata was originally considered to be primarily a, a technical resource, but more and more in organizations as they want people to speak the same language, they want people to understand the data and where it comes from and how it can be used, that we focus on the business aspect of the metadata data, and we actually ask the um, business people in our environment, what type of information can you use or could you use if it was available to you that would help you to understand the data and get better use and make better decisions based on the data. So we want to focus on business metadata, and in order to do that, we really need to involve the stakeholders, get them into a room, speak to them individually. Now, I've had opportunities to um, to try to get business or try to get metadata requirements out of people in a meeting, and I actually found that it was more effective if we didn't use the term metadata in asking them what their requirements for metadata were all about. Now, if we go to them and say, what are your metadata requirements, you're going to get a lot of blank stares. But if you ask them, what information can you use about the data that's going to help you to do your job in a more efficient and effective way? Um, not even using the term metadata, oftentimes they're gonna, it's like a spigot that somebody's going to open and all of a sudden they'll start telling you, you know, I can't find the data. I spend 80% of my time looking for the data and 20% of the time doing what I'm paid to do, which is analyzing the data. We need to involve the stakeholders as we're defining what it means to, um, to have metadata in the organization and then to govern that metadata as, as part of the initiative. We also want to look at the scope and the levels of complexity um, when we're starting a governed metadata initiative. Um, and so what I mean by scopes and level of complexity is that you may have a specific problem that you want to solve, but some people may be looking at it from more of a long-term vision. And the reason why I put the words vision into quotes here is that a vision could be in one person's head, a, a vision could be in a steering committee's head. Now, as long as it is written down and there is agreement and approval in the direction of the organization, you know, we want to look at, at making certain that we go after that low-hanging fruit, you know, the things where we can, you know, solve some problems immediately, but we also want to take a look at the longer-term vision as to where does this fit into our overall culture and our overall business of managing the data as an asset of the organization. So we want to look at the immediate needs. We also want to keep our eyes to the long-term vision of the organization and what it means to them to have information about the data and to govern the data as an asset of the organization. We need to look at the resources that we have available to us as well. Oftentimes, it's very easy to define the world as far as what you want to do with metadata and data governance, but unless you have resources that are associated with what you're doing, you're going to find that it could be quite difficult to make certain that, that you're governing the metadata the way that it needs to be, uh, to be governed. So if you purchase a tool, do you have resources to do that? If you're going to develop a business vocabulary for your organization, do you have people in the organization that will make time or that have time to pull together all the different business terms and terminology uh, for the organization? So resource requirements are something that we need to look at when we're getting started as well. We also want to look at tools, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time at the end of the session today talking about the different tools of the trade. Um, some organizations like to go after best of breed tools. So they want to go after their data governance tool, their data quality tool, their data movement tool, all as separate entities. Some organizations want to look at it as more of a combined or single platform. So we really, when we're looking at the architecture around how we're going to govern even the three levels of metadata that I've talked about, we want to look at it from a tool perspective too. Are there some templates and things that you have seen in webinars like other webinars that I've done or in other organizations that have, have given that may help you, or do we need to go and assess and analyze what tools are available on the market? And certainly one of the things that we want to do is we want to demonstrate value quickly. I'm going to share with you a funny slide on low-hanging fruit here in a minute, but, um, but the idea is if we can demonstrate value and we can demonstrate value in such a way that people in the organization are using the metadata and they trust the metadata and it's helping them to do their job, that's really the end result that we're looking for. And, and if we can do that quickly, 
by grabbing things that may already be available to us, like potentially vocabulary is already available to us, or dictionaries are already available to us. And we want to leverage those things moving forward. So I'll share with you that funny slide in just one minute. But real quickly, before we jump into everything, here is the high-level schematic that I mentioned earlier in the slides. It's got those three layers that I talked about. It's got the, let's see if my highlighter here works. Um, it's got the vocabulary layer. I'm not sure it's working. There we go. It's got the vocabulary layer. And we talked about that, the true business terminology that management of our company wants us to use when we're talking to our customers and to our vendors and to our partners and those types of things. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the vocabulary, the semantic level, the terminology, and really underscore that it's the business language that we use that is important for us all to get on the same page. Um, and therefore, when somebody asks a question about something in specific, uh, specifically in the organization, we all have the same understanding of what it is that they're asking. The second layer as part of that high-level architecture is the data dictionary. And the data dictionary is something that's very common in a lot of organizations. In the case study that I'm going to walk through real quickly, the data dictionary was for all of the data that made it into the data warehouse environment. Or it could be all of the data in your data lake or all of your big data. Whatever it is, we need to have definition for the physical data that people are going to access. And we need to have it in business terminology. So that is the data dictionary. It's that business metadata, the business explanation of the data that are in the systems within our organization. And last but not least is the data layer. We need to make sure that we know what data we have, where it resides as far as in what systems and what reference code tables. What is the technical metadata that we have about our data? Just think about it. If we would go to our organization and we would give them the capability to be able to start at a definition, at, at a vocabulary, or at a, uh, at, a, at a business term level and dig down to see what data is there that's available to me that helps me to answer questions about this business term, and then to actually physically be able to dig down into the data itself and to see what rows and columns and views and databases are, have that information, that would be a very big benefit to business people in our organization as they're moving forward with, uh, again, governing and managing data as a valued asset. We certainly need to start with governing the metadata before we can get to the point where people trust and have confidence in the data itself. So that's the high-level schematic. I'm going to share with you another view of that in a minute here that's actually taken from an organization and how they blew that out to in include you know, the relationships between things at each of the levels. And we're going to talk about those in more detail here coming up in a minute. So here's the funny slide that I saw, and I actually saw it that somebody had tweeted it, and we were talking about low-hanging fruit. And it really, it's really funny when you think about it, because a lot of people do talk about going after the low-hanging fruit first. And the definition here is that it's a noun, it's a misguided notion that's, that, that it's possible to achieve something worthwhile with little or no effort. I wouldn't necessarily say it's little or no effort, but we want to make certain that it's technically feasible to achieve what we're trying to set out to do and that we're not picking things that are so, um, so difficult and complex that it's going to take a lot of time for us to be able to demonstrate value. So in this uh, slide, the thing that, that really became funny to me was instead of using the term low-hanging fruit, they suggest that we should use low-hanging snake, which is a voracious voracious creature that eats low-hanging fruit and is certain to develop a taste for human flesh if you don't deal with it as a matter of urgency. Well, I wouldn't necessarily take it that far, but the truth is there is metadata in our environment, whether it is business terminology that exists in, if you're in the healthcare business, it might be in your benefits handbook, it might be in your provider handbook, if you're in the ins other insurance industry, it may be in your claim handbook or, or other things. But in most organizations, there are business terms that are commonly used across the organization that 
the people at the top of the organization want everybody to be speaking the same language about. If we can gather a group of people to create a first cut out of vocabulary and we can get it approved at the highest level of the organization, that's a real benefit to the organization. So we'll talk about once we've collected that information, what do we do with it and how do we relate it to other metadata that we care most about. So we're going to walk through each of the three tiers of the, meta, of the metadata of that high-level architecture that I spoke about before. This first level is the semantic layer, is the vocabulary, or the business language that we use. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to share some examples with you of what specific metadata you might include in your, um, in your business vocabulary, in your semantic layer. And that would be you know, the business term itself, a business definition of the term. I've always joked about these things that I call cheeseburger definitions. What, what's a cheeseburger? It's a burger with cheese. What's the a patient account? It's the account of a patient. Now we need to have true business definitions, especially for the items at the, at the vocabulary or the semantic layer, if we want people in the organization to get to the point that we're all speaking the same language. We may also want to know what domain or subject area does that relate to in the organization. So again, if you're a healthcare industry, you want to see all the business terms that are associated with claims or providers. You know, if you're in the manufacturing, you want to see all the, the, the business terms that are associated with raw materials and production. You know, we also want to know, besides for the subject area, that, that business term is related to, we also want to know who's, the, who's responsible for that term. Who's responsible for validating or even providing the initial uh, definition of what that business term is? And whether that's a business steward or it's a data owner or however you define it in your organization, we need to know who the person is that has accountability for making certain that that term is the way that it needs to. If that means going back to the handbooks and, and making sure and validating that it's, it's correct and that we're using the right terminology, that could be what is necessary in your organization. But if we collect the business term, the definition, the domain, the steward, and we know when it was last updated, that in itself is just a few pieces of metadata that we could collect about the business terminology at the semantic layer. So let's kind of do that same analysis on the business metadata layer, the data dictionary layer. So really, in this, uh, in this example, the one that I'm going to share with you, it's the data that's in their business intelligence environment. Or in your organization, it might be the data that's in different systems or your master data environment or your big data environment. But we need to have that data well defined. Well, what metadata do we need at the business metadata layer? You may need to know what are we calling this piece of data or this element of data? Um, what's the definition of that uh, piece of data within the context of the database or the system that it's being used in? We want to know, again, what domain or subject area that piece of data uh, is associated with, and we want to know who is the person in the organization who is the domain steward or the subject matter expert who is the one that's making decisions based on the definition of that piece of data across the organization rather within, than within a specific silo. I refer to them as data domain stewards. I've seen other organizations define them as data owners or data custodians or subject matter experts. They're truly the subject matter experts for each of the, the subjects of data across your organization. I've shared in the past that that is the most difficult piece to, to fill in when we're defining roles and responsibilities around data governance is that tactical domain steward level position. Let's also talk about the technical metadata, and that's down at the data layer of the three layers that I just talked about. That's the physical data structures, the reference data and the reference data values, and some of that metadata may include the database name, table name, column name. These are real physical attributes of the data itself. Um, the view names, the reference data, uh, data. In one organization that I worked with, as they put policy in place to govern the data itself, it was not just the database structures, but if somebody wanted to add or change a value to a reference data, a piece of reference data, they also need to go through a governed process where somebody looks at it and says, do we need to add these values? If we need to add these values, you know, perhaps there are some changes that also are going to take place at the vocabulary layer. You know, so if we're saying that now we've got new types of 
uh, providers within an organization. Um, and so because of that, we're creating new values in the reference code table, and we may find that we're also changing the vocabulary of the organization, that these three new types of providers are something that haven't been defined in the past. So we want to make sure that when we're looking at changes to the different types of metadata, that we look at the entire picture across all three layers rather than just where the requests for changes are being made. So those are the three tiers. There's the vocabulary tier, the business metadata tier at the dictionary level, and then the technical metadata that's down at the data level itself. So again, this is the diagram that I showed you that basically has all three of those components in it. Let's take a look at that in, in a different way here, and let's look at an example that one organization used to define how they were governing their metadata, governing their governance metadata, in fact, around those three layers. So in this organization, they started with the vocabulary level and the business terms, exactly the way that we've described it so far. Then they created dictionaries for each of their um, databases that were in their data warehouse so that we could link between the business terms and the, the, um, the data dictionaries themselves. And then there was the data layer down below. And the one thing that's really nice about this diagram in comparison to the other diagram that I shared is that this also highlights the relationships between the different types of metadata at the different layers, the relationships between the metadata um, in the, within the same layer. So we, it kind of gives you an overall picture, and it's very easy to talk to a diagram like this and say that this is the governance metadata that we need to collect, and we need to put it somewhere that we can get it into the hands of business people and business end users. So I hope a diagram like this is kind of helpful to you. It takes that early schematic that I had drawn and kind of fills it out a little bit more and shows that there's not only the different types of, of data at those layers, but there's relationships to them that are really important in helping people to understand where the data came from, what data relates to a business term, and all of those things. I'll lay some of those out for you here in a couple slides as well. I'm going to lay it out for you right here. Um, the, the relationships between vocabulary and vocabulary that was one of the things that was not shown on the previous diagram, is that we only had one business term rather than having a second or a third business term. But in one of the organizations that I worked with recently, they decided that they wanted to group their vocabulary business terms. So there was a vocabulary to vocabulary relationship, so they were actually mapping business terms to other business terms so that people could get a general picture of all the different terms that were related to a single subject matter within the organization. Now also, there's a relationship between the vocabulary and the data dictionary. If people are looking for all information about material and they want to see all the places in data resources where information about our raw materials are available, we've got to relate the vocabulary to the data dictionary itself. So what we're really doing is we're relating the term to the business data, but we're really relating it to the business data through the metadata. Also want to talk about the relationships between the data dictionary, from data dictionary to data dictionary. You know, I don't know about your organization, but a lot of the organizations that I've worked in, they use the same term in different ways depending on what application that data is stored in but they may call it the same thing. So they may need to be related. They, they actually may call it something completely different. And we may need to make certain that when we're talking in a certain term in our business metadata layer that we understand that it may be called different things. It may have different definitions depending on the context of that piece of data. And we also look for a relationship between the data dictionary and the data itself, where once we've identified where all the pieces of data or all the business um, terms and business metadata is about that specific business term, we may also then want to be able to dig into the data itself and say, show me the physical tables where I can go and get access to this data. So it's not just a matter of having these three different layers, it's a matter of having these three different layers, but having the linkages between them so that when people go into whatever tool it is that you're providing to them, that they can navigate between the vocabulary and the dictionary, between the dictionary and the data, between the data and the data, all of these things that I've laid out here, you know, not only the three layers, but the relationships between the items in the three layers as well. Hope that makes sense to you. 
Um, the tool decision, so when we get to the point where we're governing our metadata and we need to take a look, and we, we know that we've got the glossary, excuse me, or the vocabulary defined. We know that we've got the dictionary defined, and those two can both be works in progress. So don't expect them to get completed quickly. But we know that we know where our data is. We can pull off data definition language and structures of our data. Once we have that, we've got to start thinking about where are we going to store this information that's going to be useful to people within the organization. So what are some of the things that we should consider when we're looking at these tools to govern our metadata, to govern our, govern our vocabulary, dictionaries, and our data? Well, the first thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that we're collecting metadata that's required to support the governance of those things. And I think that will become a little bit more clear in a minute here when I, I share for you, you know, where an organization has developed policy and procedure around changing those things. And we need to know what metadata is required to support governance, but we also need to know the workflow required to support governance. So in an instance where somebody would be making a request to change something at the data level that might actually impact something at the vocabulary level, we want to make sure that we know that we can involve people in a specific workflow within the tool. And a lot of the tools on the market these days have excellent workflow features where we can even incorporate it into our email so we can send you know, notices to people and approvals to people through our, our email. So that the workflow required to support governance is extremely important important. The placement of the tool within our existing environment is another really important consideration. Are we going to try to, you know, the truth is that if you're building a metadata repository tool or if you're using a metadata repository tool, it's something like building a data warehouse where you've got disparate metadata coming from different places. You want to make sure that you know what metadata you need from other tools. So that placement within the environment becomes very important to you as you're defining you know, what is the overall metadata picture, not just the governance metadata picture, but do we need to know transformation logic? Do we know, need to know what reports that, that data uh, exists on and those types of things? You know, is that metadata available to us within our environment? We need to make certain that there's a commitment to funding to purchase and sustain a product. It's one thing to purchase a product, but that's only part of the total cost of ownership for a product. There's resource costs. There's uh, renewal license costs and those types of things. Just make sure that there's a commitment. If you're starting to look at, at metadata tools, there's a commitment to funding and purchasing, uh, purchasing the tool. Also, there's information that's available from the industry analyst perspective that can help you in your tool decisions. And so whether it's Gartner Group or some of the other groups, it's very important that, um, that you have access to information from the industry analysts. There's also the resource requirements. Make sure that you have the people that you need in order to implement the tools that you're talking about. So these are just a bunch of tool, um, tool considerations when you're looking to purchase tools um, for your environment. Some tool decision best practices may be, do we have an overall data strategy defined? Do we know where the metadata and the data governance tool is going to fit into the overall architecture? Are we packaging together requirements in such a way that it makes sense to the vendors when we're putting out an RFP to them? And that's the next step, is to, to find and validate a request for proposal that takes these requirements that we have from our business community and packages them in such a way that it makes it easy for them to understand when they're responding to the RFP. And then also to identify and target specific tools and vendors. There's a lot of tools on the market. We need to make sure that we have a plan of attack when we're looking to purchase a product that we will use to govern our metadata at the vocabulary, dictionary, and data layer. Um, some more considerations, you need to manage that process, uh, the RFP process with the vendors. You want to select a tool and make sure you have the funding. You want to engage in a proof of concept before you purchase a product. I mean, a lot of the vendors will tell you that they can do everything that you ask, but the only way that we're really going to find out is if we put together a solid plan for our proof of concept and we engage the vendor in the proof of concept before we make the decision to purchase the product. And then last, finally, we, we enter in the agreement for the tool and we begin to implement the tool. So those are just some considerations when you're putting best practice steps together for analyzing the tools that are in your marketplace. 
when you get to the point where you create that RFP to get information from the vendors to make a, a tool selection, I wanted to share with you some metadata categories and some data governance categories that you may want to consider including in your request for a proposal. One of those would be, you know, do they provide the meta models to you? Do they provide information about their software releases? It's really good to know the data about the data about the data, if that makes sense to you. Um, it's, it's really the meta metadata that goes, that comes from the meta models. And as a, a former repository administrator in, in an earlier life, um, I knew that I studied the meta models. I needed to know what information was going to be stored in the tool and where it was going to be stored in the tool, and knowing when the new releases are going to come and what the changes to the meta, model, meta models were going to be in the back end of the tool. We want to make sure that we have extensibility as being a category for an RFP. Is the tool extensible to collect things that, we don't, that don't come out of the box? Um, we want to make sure that we can create self-defined loads, meaning that if we have a list of domains and definitions of what the domains are, that rather than having to hand enter each of those into the tool, we can put it into a spreadsheet and we can create a self-defined load and make certain that when you're looking at metadata tools, you look at their ability to be able to do self-defined loads. Almost all of them have that capability, but make sure that during your proof of concept that you focus on that, because that's going to be one of the ways that you're going to find that it's easiest to get your metadata into the tool. The role representation is really important. We, we know that we might have an administrator role, but we also know that we want to, might want to have a specific role for people that are requesting changes or that people have the authorization to change pieces of metadata within the metadata tool. We want to see how well the tool integrates to different processes and procedures that we have in place in our environment. So again, these are just several um, metadata categories for an RFP. A couple more of those categories were, can we control, uh, first of all, can we manage change control of the, of the items that are in the, uh, in the repository? Can we control versions? If we have two things that are called the same thing that mean something different, then we want to make sure that we can have different versions of the same thing or at least the same name within the product. Um, so change control and versioning is very important. One thing I wanted to throw out there is that if you look in the upcoming issue of the TDAN publication, there's an article that really goes into the details of each of these different layers of metadata categories for an RFP. So the, the change control and versioning is important, the, the communications is important, the end user requirements, training and education, what type of training and education do these vendors provide for their tools, and what are the resources that are required to make these tools operate the way that we want to within our organization. So that's just a handful or maybe two hands full of metadata categories. Let's take a look at some data governance categories here real quick. Um, there's the usability of the tool as a business glossary. There's the ability to create custom attributes and relationships between things. So for example, if you ha use a schema similar to the one that I shared of the three different layers, that we can create custom attributes and relationships between things that, again, might not come out of the box. We want to make sure that we can store information about our data stewards and customize the roles for however you define steward within your organization. We want to make sure that we can put approval workflows into the tool, that we, allow, we provide for allowable values um, for information in the tools. These are all different categories of metadata stuff that we need about data governance um, that we need to collect in the tool and make available to people, again, to have a governed environment specifically around the metadata that's associated with our governance, uh, our governance initiative. And some more data governance categories. Um, can we store information about data lineage and impact analysis? Do we have a way of creating a hierarchy of data artifacts or profiling different diverse data sources across the organization? Um, we want to make certain that we can record issues and data logs and we can track them through the resolution and we can report those in dashboards or status reports to people to show that our governance and our metadata initiative is having an impact on the organization. Um, support for internal audit and data governance metrics, we need to have a way to be able to demonstrate that 
you know, while we're doing all these things to govern our organization, to govern our data, to govern our metadata, that we have a way of being able to measure the success within the organization. What value, what business value is it bringing to people? Those people that said that they were spending 80% of their time looking for data, well, maybe now they're only spending 40% of their time looking for metadata or looking for data. And the fact is the fact that you saved them X number of minutes or X percentage of their time, the question is what can they be doing with the time that they have now saved because this metadata is now available to people. So there's different categories uh, for data, from a data governance perspective, there's different categories from a metadata perspective that kind of relate to each other that when we're putting together an RFP, you know, we want to make sure that we're asking the vendors about their tools and how they handle these kinds of things. So one of the last two subjects I want to go over real quickly is, hey, it's one thing that we collect all this information and we put it in the tool, but it's not good if people have the ability to be able to change it or add new entries without going through some sort of governed process. So in some organizations, they'll put together add change policies around corporate vocabulary. And they'll put together separate ad change policies around changes to the data dictionary or even at the data layer. You know, the interesting example that I shared before where somebody wants to make a change at the data layer that's going to actually impact things on the vocabulary layer, we need to be able to navigate throughout our, our, our governance metadata to make sure that when we're adding something as simple as adding a couple different values to a reference code table, that we can reflect that at the business semantic layer in the organization as well. And sometimes it requires that we put a policy in place to make certain that people understand the policy and that we have somebody who governs that policy to make sure that, that, that it's being followed. You know, we certainly, if we can cut off the changes to the tables where people go directly to the DBAs and request changes and force them to go through a process where we're going to more clearly think out what changes we're making, and that is a truly governed environment as compared to where people can go directly to the DBAs and say, add this column, I want to call it this, put it here. You know, it's a lot different than saying, okay, well, do we really need that field? You know, are we looking at the right place to put that field? Are we putting a definition to that field? How does it relate to other data? How does it relate to our business terminology? All of those things are important when it comes to governing the metadata at the layers that we're talking about here. So what are the steps that we need to, to follow in order to put a policy in place? Well, most organizations have data policy. To start with an existing policy as a basis, you know, use your data governance manager or the person that has that responsibility to tweak that policy to include things that you need. You know, get it approved by whoever your sponsor is of your activities in your organization, and ultimately it needs to be signed off at the highest level of the organization. So these are some really quick steps that you can take to develop policy around protecting things that are in our vocabulary dictionary and in the data itself. And in the policy, you may have statements like this. The purpose of a corporate policy is to, best, to, to apply a best practice change management process for additions and changes and requests to corporate whatever, whether it's vocabulary, dictionary, or data. The policy is put in place to assure auditable processes for the management of these things, their definition, their production, and their usage within your organization. And then the policy impacts uh, the policy impacts will be enforced by every person in the organization that's looking to change one of these things at these different layers within our organization. Now, I'm a Pittsburgh guy. I've probably said that before, and our coach of our, uh, our famous football team, the Steelers, says the standard is the standard. And I think he may, might mean it in a different sense than I'm using it here, but we need to have standards. We need to have policies. We need to have um, these things in place to improve the business understanding of our data and our metadata in our organization, and that needs to be governed itself as well. So this diagram is a high-level schematic of how that policy might actually look, where a requester makes an ad change request and gives it to a data governance manager who then bounces it off of the people within their circle of influence and maybe the circle of influence that's around their circle of influence to make sure that they truly understand what change is being requested. They compare it to the standard. They share it with the steering committee where a decision point is made whether the change can take place and it's handed back to the completed change request back to the requester. 
if we can make certain that steps like this are being followed for any change that we make to vocabulary, dictionary, or data, that is a heck of a governed environment. And again, it's, it's something that's relatively easy to put together if you can get people to provide vocabulary and dictionary and, uh, and information about the data itself. So lastly, we're going to talk about the role of communications. You know, we know that we need to understand what the business or what the end users say that they need. And I put need in quotes there because, you know, they may not really know what they need. So that's where it really becomes the job of the data governance team to help them to, to, to be able to articulate what they need out of, out of a tool, out of the metadata. They need to, we need to understand what they're going to use, what's going to help them in their job now. So there's a difference between what they need and what they're going to use. We're going to talk about the, import, well, the importance of early metadata requirements. I talked about that earlier, where we need to meet with stakeholders and get their understanding of what they need. And then, you know, the, so that's kind of the early metadata requirements. And then there's really the importance of uh, late handholding. What I mean by that is, as people start to learn to use the vocabulary, um, that's a change. People may be used to using the terminology that they use. So if we can help to hold their hand and change things within request forms so that we make certain that they are actually directed to the vocabulary, and this is the kind of blessed terminology that we're using within the organization, let's hold their hand for a little bit and make sure that they understand why it's necessary and help them to gain access to this information. So there's a bunch of different metadata and data governance communication types. We need to make them aware that the metadata is available. We want to know when they're going to use it and how they're going to use it. We want to provide training and education to them. We want to make sure that we put change management in place in order to truly govern our metadata environment. And I've shared in the past this, this model of communication plan. And what I'm talking about is this one aspect of it, which is about governance documentation and how it needs, that information needs to be shared with the different people in different roles across the organization, whether it's through the onboarding process, the, uh, the orientation process, onboarding process, or ongoing processes in your organization. So if you'd like to talk to me more about this communication plan, I'd be glad to answer questions you have about it. Um, here's kind of a quick summary before I turn it back over to Shannon here of the things that we talked about today. We talked about the three-tiered approach to mastering metadata, the description of the metadata in each of those layers. We talked about a little bit about planning and the purchase of, of data governance and metadata tools, processes for managing metadata change, and the role of communications in mastering metadata within our environment. And with that, I would like to turn it back over to Shannon to see if we have any questions from the webinar. I'm not sure that she's there. Well, you know what? Um, in the case, I know that she was having some problems in, in staying logged in to the, to the sound and, and on the phone. So uh, I'm going to take some of the questions. I'm here, Bob. Ah, there she is. Sorry, Thank having you. technical. <laughs> here we go. We've got lots of questions coming in, some great questions. We may not have time to get to it all today. However, um, keep the questions coming in as one of the great things about this particular webinar series is Bob will write up answers to the questions that we don't have time to get to, and I'll get that out in the follow-up email with links to the slides, links to the recording, and other information requested throughout the webinar. Um, for this particular webinar, this will go out by end of day Monday. So let's get started, because there are just a ton of questions coming in. Um, first question, Bob, is there a concept of certification of data lineage, technical and business metadata? Well, actually, it's interesting that you use the word certification. So I look at two different things. I look at validation and I look at, look at certification. So, valid, so I'm not really sure what you mean. I, I'm going I'm to assume that it's certification. So certification of data lineage would mean that you know, that, that you have actually validated how data gets from one place to the other. Certification would be that we get people to understand how the data move from one place to another. So let me make that distinction. The validation is, you know, let's make sure that we put the quality checks and the data movement checks in place and that the certification is that people understand where they can get access to that information about the certification. So I'm not sure that you're certifying the data movement or the ETL itself, but you're certainly validating it, and then you're certifying people on their ability to be able to use that certificate, to be able to use that data. I hope that answers your question. 
and uh, came from Dan. Dan, you can certainly let us know if that you have additional um, questions on that. And the next question, Bob, was um, in regards to your relationship between three tiers diagram. Uh, so uh, back several slides. Uh, the question is, uh, can you give examples of that slide, examples of that diagram? Oh, I'd be glad to. Um, have an organization that I'm working with that is looking to um, to add a new business program. Uh, it's a healthcare insurance uh, company, and they're looking to add a program um, that's going to do certain ways of episodes of care and those types of things in the health environment. And the the change request that came in was, we want to add these columns to these specific tables in order to make this uh, make this program function effectively. Well, through further analysis, we found that, number one, well, we know that these new pieces of data are going to require definitions at the dictionary level, because in this organization, anything that goes into the warehouse has to have a dictionary entry. So we know that not just by asking to change some data down at the bottom level, that there's a relationship to the dictionary layer. But then we also realized that this program that's really being implemented that is causing all these changes to take place introduced some new terminology to the organization. And so not only are we changing data at the data level, we're changing data at the data dictionary level, we're also needing to look at the vocabulary to the organization and make certain that we've got all the appropriate terms associated with that new program that's being put in place. So that's just an example of how it's important to be able to navigate and to be able to make sure that when we're looking at impact analysis, we look at all three levels and do our due diligence and do our impact analysis rather than having them stand alone. All right, moving on to the next question. I'll try and get, like I said, get as many through as we can today. So, but keep them coming because we'll get those answers to you uh, no matter what. What is the relationship types for the vocabulary to vocabulary relationships? Uh, were they synonymous? Um, you know what? It, it's not necessarily synonymous, but the, the, the biggest relationship between things at the vocabulary level is almost like vocabulary groupings. So again, I'll go to, to use a healthcare example. So all of the terms that may be associated with the subject area of claim may be related to each other within the vocabulary. So if we're going to re relate um, claims, uh, claim number to claim date and, uh, and claim diagnosis, um, those are all three things that might be described up at the, at the vocabulary level but they may be grouped together under the category of claims. So that's the type of relationship that I'm talking about in relating business vocabulary things to other business vocabulary things. All right, moving on to the next question. Um, regarding tools, we always get this question. It's a very popular question. Um, uh, but more specifically in terms of tools, at uh, this particular person's company, we have our metadata structured, as you propose, business layer and data layer. Bob, have you found a tool that's good for what you're proposing? Um, we've been, they've been struggling and have tried several different tools. You know what, I, I, it would be great to answer that question offline, but I'll give a quick answer uh, in the webinar here too. Um, there are a bunch of tools that will handle, um, to handle all three of those layers, will handle the workflow. Um, so I'm not going to suggest one tool over another. I just went through an RFP process with a client where we went from four tools that we were looking at to seven tools, down to five, and then back up to six, and then down to three, until we finally analyzed and analyze it down to the one tool that we selected. The fact was that all of those vendors told us that they could do what we were asking for because we were very clear in the RFP. Um, however, as we did our due diligence and our research of those vendors, we narrowed it down to a few. So I'm not going to point at one vendor or another to say that they'll, they'll do it better than the other. But if you want to have that conversation with me, please look me up and contact me, and I'll be glad to answer those questions for you. We try to well, see. And we try to stay tool agnostic here as much as possible. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Uh, it's just a uh, kind of an extension and a different angle on the tool question. Uh, at, at this particular person's company, our enterprise architects have selected two different metadata tools, one for data and one for information. When it comes to the business terms and definitions, I, this person doesn't see the distinction between data and information. What are your thoughts on that? I have a very clear distinction between data and information. 
Okay, I'd say that if you take data, if you take something like uh, one, two, three, four, five, and that's a piece of data, and you add some context to it, and you say that that context of one, two, three, four, five is a zip code, or it's a dollar amount, and what specific type type of dollar amount it is, you know, it only becomes information when the metadata is added to the data. So the definition, the context, everything about the data added to the to the, the data, that that's when it, it really has meaning to the organization. So that's the relationship that I see between data and information. And I don't really necessarily understand why you would want to store that in different tools. I think people are going to want to be able to navigate through that in, within their own company. All right. Well, I'm afraid that we're kind of out of time for any more questions, but like I said, one of the most popular, one of the best things about this webinar series is I will get those questions that um, we have to Bob, and Bob will write out the answers to those. And uh, that will also come out in the follow-up email, which will go out by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording of the session, as well as information, additional information from Bob. Um, Bob, thank you so much for this great presentation today, and thank you so much to our attendees um, for being so engaged with everything we do and taking your time to attend our webinars. Bob, anything thank else you want to wrap up? Thank you very much, everybody. With? Look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you, Bob. Hope everyone has a great day. Take care now. Bye. Bye.